All right, guys, we're going to get ready with our interview here with Mark Maddox. There he is. How we doing, Mark? Popped up. I'm pretty good. How we doing? I'm not too bad. No complaints. Yeah. Out in uh, sunny Arizona, huh? Correct. Yeah. Well, what's nice it? and hot. Oh yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's get right into it. So first off, I'd like to thank you for taking some time uh, out of your busy schedule. I know you got a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, spending some time with me and the uh, Buffalo Fanatics uh, community. So I really appreciate it. And uh, I know we've been talking for a little while behind the scenes. So thank you so very much. Yeah, no problem. Um, I might, uh, we have some comments coming through. So I might, you know, if we're done with questions and stuff, I might take some comments if you're all right with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's just go over your background a little bit. Um, 1991, you were a ninth round draft pick out of Northern Michigan. Um, you played for the Bills from 91 to 97, and then you went to the Cardinals from 98 to 2000, 10 years in the league. So tell me a little bit about uh, what it was like to play 10 years in the NFL. <laughs> well, it takes a toll on your body. So, sure. you know, the main thing was, you know, it was an experience. You know, um, you come from a, a – I came from a big city from Milwaukee and went to a small Division II school and then got picked up by the Bills – you know, small community, which I loved. Sure. Um, but to be in the league for 10 years, um, it's hard work. It's dedication. Yeah. You know? Um, so uh, after that, you went to the Cardinals. So when you were with the Cardinals, you, you retired in 2000. Um, so what, what was how, the transition like after the NFL to your everyday life? Um. The move from Buffalo to Arizona, um, the biggest difference, well, there are a couple of differences. There was the team difference, you know, as compared to the organization between the Cardinals and the organization between the Bills. Totally different, you know, more family oriented with the Bills, more business oriented with the Cardinals. Okay. Um, so after I spent my three years there and that time was coming for, this, for you know, your career to end. Sure. It, um, it is kind of hard because you, no matter how much you think you prepare for it, you don't, you, you don't, you, you're not there. If you don't have anything established, I don't think if you have anything established while you're in the process of playing, it's going to be that much harder to start after you're playing. Sure. Just due to the fact that, you know, it's a little bit different today. I know when I was playing, you know, our minimum salaries were nowhere near what the minimum salaries are today, right. you know the benefits that they have are nowhere near what the benefits they had then, you know? So it's a little, I think it's a little easier today for guys to accumulate and save, you know, money because the money is greater than what it was when we played. Okay. Yeah. You know? um, if you weren't a starter or not a starter, but a big name starter, you know, making the big dollars, your contract could have been, you know, $200,000, right. which don't get me wrong is a lot of money, Sure. but after taxes, you know, your, your, just your basic living expenses, you know, three quarters of it is pretty much gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. I tell people sometimes that my first year or between my first four years being a ninth round draft pick, there was a guy who was picked up. I'm not going to say what round, um, with the bills, he made more money in one year than I made in four years. Oh, wow. And he never touched it. He never touched a field. Oh, Wow. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So, you know, so where you get drafted and all of that, it um, it just happens. It adds up, you know, over the years and you do what you can. But that transition is you always think you can play. Right. You know, coaches may not pick you up on a team, but, you know, in your mind you can play and it's kind of hard to let that go. Sure. You know, oh, I'm going to play next year. I'm going to play next year. But if that team doesn't pick you up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, kind of SOL. So in 2000, when you were with the Cardinals, what was the deciding factor for you to say, okay, I've, I've played 10 years, I'm, I'm good? Was it kind of well, your body telling you that you're ready to go, or was it a mindset thing? Well, or? no, I, I actually thought that um, I would play another year or two. Okay. You know, because I still felt good, mm -hmm. and I was still moving pretty good. 
but the Cardinals had their transition where we had lost Ferguson. He went to another team. Um, he was the director um, at that point in time. And we had lost our head coach. And so we everything was kind of out in the open. And when I got new people in, I actually thought I was going to end up in New Orleans. Oh, really? With the Saints. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I went down there for a tryout and everything like that. But the coach who wanted me down there, he point blank told me, he goes, Mark, I'm doing everything I can to get you here. He says, you're my guy. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be kind of hard. He goes, it's not going to be – he didn't say hard. He just said it's going to be tough because the te the people that came into New Orleans at the same time, the I think it was the director of player personnel, really liked the kid from – from Seattle where he was at before, where he came from. Okay. So he really liked that kid. So he said, I'm going to do everything I can to get you here, but just know they like this kid because they had him before. They know him. I know you. I want you. They know him. Right. So I'll see what I can do. Sure. And so when I didn't get picked up by them, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I only had – a couple of teams that were interested at the time mm. and the main focus or interest was with the saints. And when they didn't pick me up, I'm just like, I'm pretty much done. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. So tell me what it was like. Um, we, everybody hears about the fan base in Buffalo and you know, how, how well they are. Um, tell me what it was like playing uh, in that city in the, in the early to mid nineties. Um, you've all heard it before. Unbelievable. And that's the God's honest truth. Just thinking about it right now, I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> from just thinking about it. Um, the best example I can say is that I was in Buffalo for seven years and I was with the Cardinals for three years. Um, when I was with the Cardinals, they didn't have the stadium. They played at ASU. We would go to games and there would be, we could play the Raiders. And if there was 50, 60,000 people there, there was 20 to 30,000 Raider fans. Oh, wow. Sometimes it looked like we were playing away when we were actually playing at yeah, home. Yeah, sure. Okay. And the best example I can give you of how the energy is at, well, it's New Era Stadium now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I can give you a great example is last year they had the greatest comeback reunion. So they had all those guys back yeah. and stuff like that. And... I remember riding from the hotel in the bus and as you're driving to the stadium, all I see are Bill's jerseys, people walking wow. around in Bill's jerseys, wow. Bill's jerseys, Bill's jerseys. And it was so amazing that when we were in the booth and before anything started, you could just feel the energy in that place. Yeah. The energy was so great. You know, the Cardinals now have the stadium, Sure. You know, and they'll get 70,000 people in there and, you know, they'll pack it up. But you'll still see 10, 15,000 jerseys of the other team. Oh, wow. I tried to count the number of Jets jerseys there were in the area where I was sitting. I guarantee you, I only found, I think, maybe three or four <laughs> Jets jerseys. Yeah. And I was just like, that's amazing. But that energy was just, it was just, it was so powerful. Awesome. So what was it like during the uh, Super Bowl run? What was the energy like in that locker room? Um, the energy was always up. Yeah. You know, it was for the whole seven years I was there, you know, everybody was confident. Everybody was positive. Everybody, you know, because you work, Marv Levy prepared you. And yeah. if you're not prepared, you're not going to win. Right. You know, and Marv would always say, um, what we have to do is easy. Um, winning is easy. Everything is easy. Life is easy. Yeah. But it's not simple. Right. It's not, it's not, you know, how much work are you going to put in? What are you going to do to make yourself better? Are you going to do the little things that are required to do the big things? Sure. You know, and it was just the whole, the whole chemistry of all the guys was just, everybody was together. Yeah. And that's the, that's the key. Yeah. When it came game time, everybody was together. Everybody was on the same page. So that leads me to the next question. What is your fondest memory of your NFL career, whether it be in Buffalo, Arizona, or overall? Um, I, you know, I know a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with the concussions and stuff like that, sure. the CTE and all that sure. stuff that's going on. 
And I'll be honest with you, like a lot of my memory memories of certain things have dwindled. Yeah. Um, but I would have to say my, my, I remember one of the best things that happened to me was I got to go in the game against the Raiders and I idolized Marcus Allen as a sure. kid. Sure. And he was actually playing at the Raiders and we played in the Coliseum and I got put in in the fourth quarter. And he was still in the game and they ran a little play. And I remember tackling Marcus Allen and laying on the ground in a Coliseum going, I can't believe I just tackled Marcus Allen, <laughs> you know, pretty cool. That was yeah. Like the, yeah. That was like the greatest feeling um, just tackling him, you know, but just being a starter in a Super Bowl was pretty amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, I'll always cherish that. So, so you brought up the, um, the concussion stuff. So do you feel the game speed today is faster or it was faster when you were playing? Because we see all this stuff coming out with the concussions and the CTE and all that stuff now and all the rules that have been put into place to protect the players, especially like the quarterbacks and the receivers and stuff like that. Do you feel the, the speed of the game has just gotten a lot faster or do you feel like it was well, faster back when you were I, playing? I, I really can't say that the speed of the game has gotten faster. I will say that they're, you know, the players – you know, because the speed was there when we were playing. You look sure. at Deion Sanders and his speed. You look at, sure. you know, I was a linebacker, came out, and I ran a four five five. Yeah. You know, and so the speed was there. Um, but it seems like now because there's more, you know, it seems like teams are throwing more than running. Yeah. And so there's more high high speed collisions or more high impact sure. collisions sure. just because of the more passes. Right. So, you know, I feel that. You know, the game, definitely the bigger guys are, you know, they're getting faster. Yeah. You know, and – but it's just the size right now. I think the size of the players, you know, I think nothing's really – if you look at, like, the average lineman, you know, offensive line, it's about the same, maybe a few pounds more than, you know, years ago. Sure. But other than that, I just think that there's more – more collisions and i think the league's trying to do a better job and i think they're doing a better job yeah. of preventing some of those collisions you know but you can't let it get to the point where a defensive guy is afraid to hit a guy yeah you know and i look at a lot of stuff you know i like look at some of my highlights and stuff that i found and it's like one thing that i noticed is that every time i went in my head was up my head was never down sure you know yeah. and i look at some stuff now and you see a lot of head down and stuff like that where yeah. you have that you know the tendency to actually you know maybe hurt yourself yeah and i don't know if it's the way things are you know being taught or if you're if we get lazy and stuff like that but you know marv levy always said tackle and torso right you know you want to see what you're hitting right you, you got to see it your head's got to be up right now i mean when i was when i played high school football i was a safety and i always led with my helmet that's just the way i was taught and we're talking you know i'm 41 years old now but i just feel like that was what you're taught because you're looking at your target like you said you're going to look at your target first and then you're you're initial instinct is to put your head down and go for your target so i i totally understand that. and with being a linebacker i mean you guys are in on a lot of those collisions over the middle. So um, it's amazing that, you know, you just, you didn't suffer any, any kind of long-term uh, effects of that stuff. So, I mean, that's awesome. Um, so question for you. So are you still following the bills? Yes, I still follow the bills. Okay. Like, yeah, like hardcore yeah. or are you just kind of like, um, I follow the bills and the Cardinals. Um, okay. You know, I watch teams. I try to, I just want to make sure that they do well. Yeah. You know, I have loyalty to them and stuff sure. like that. Um, I met with the, the bills backers out here. I went to the playoff game with them. Okay. And so very cool. Yeah. You know, so, so what do I you... try to follow. I just, just so many players though. Yeah. What do you think of the, the current state of, of the Bills organization right now as a whole? Like coaching changes, looks like we, we broke the drought last year. Like what? Oh, yes. What's your, what's your feelings of the Bills' outlook for the future? You know, I, I kind of I, – I believe they're going to do well. Um, I think it just takes time. I like Coach McDermott's attitude. Okay. You know, I like the fact that, you know, he came in and – 
you know, there were some big losses last year. Everybody thought were big losses mm-hmm. last year. Yeah. You know, letting guys go and stuff like that. And sure. and his philosophy is pretty simple. You know, what we have here is what's going to win games, yeah. not what's somewhere else. Right. And when you, like I said, when you get those guys to believe that and you put in the right right amount of time, the right amount of practice, the right amount of things, and you can win ball games. I, I feel very positive that they can get to the playoffs. Oh, okay. You know, they got some great young guys. They had some great um, free agent transactions this year. Sure. You know, so he knows how to put a team together. You know, just look at last year. Yeah. What did they say? They were going to win, what, four games? Yeah. No more than four games. Yeah. And they almost won a playoff game. Yeah, true. Yeah, exactly. So, um, all right. So I know something that's near and dear to your heart is your foundation. So do you want to talk about the Help One Foundation and kind of how you got started with that? Oh, yeah. Um, when I was in Buffalo, I, I always did a lot of charitable work. Okay. I even got the NFL Extra Effort Man of the Month Award for doing, you know, charitable stuff. And it all started, I got to backtrack, it all started in high school. Like I said, I grew up in Milwaukee, a big city, but I grew up in the inner city and I grew up poor. And so in high school and stuff like that, I always felt sorry for myself. You know, like, woe is me, I don't have this, I don't have that, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Well, when I got to um, my senior year, I got selected for the All-Star game. And the All-Star game, they had us go to the Shriners Hospital. Oh, wow. Because it was the Shriners All-Star Game in Milwaukee. But the Shriners Hospital was in Chicago. So we took a bus down there, and they picked two kids from the north and two kids from the south and went to see kids who were severely, you know, severely challenged. Sure. And I was one of those kids to go. And one of the kids, his ribs were, he was sitting in the bed, but it was like his ribs were up. That's where his hips were under his ribs. Wow. And I was just like, wow. But that kid smiled. That kid was happy that a bunch of high school football players were there to visit them. Yeah. Wow. And he wasn't the only one. All the boys and girls that were there were super excited that we were there. Well, one of the kids that we were going to see, we didn't get a chance to see because he was sleeping. And so we told his parents we would go back and we didn't get a chance to go back. And on the way back to, you know, Wisconsin, we had to write about our experience. And I wrote and you know, and it it made me cry because it's like you promised this kid that you're going to come back, but you didn't get a chance to come back. And just to look at all the smiles and everything on these kids faces and how happy and excited they were to see us. Some of these kids couldn't walk, you know, and I'm sitting here complaining because I don't have five pair of blue jeans, you yeah. know, and stuff like that. And I, it opened my eyes. And sure. from that point forward, it was like, I can't feel sorry for myself because of simple things like that. Here are these kids who their outlook isn't the greatest, but their attitude was so much bigger than mine's could have ever been. Yeah. And so when I went to um, Northern Michigan, I started doing um, Special Olympic stuff with them at Northern Michigan. And I even still did special Olympics when I was in Buffalo and just did a bunch of stuff. And so after I got done playing, you know, I still did things when I was in Buffalo, I had a thing called gifts, milk and cookies. So on Christmas time, I would pick up, I would get families, bring them to a location, have gifts, have milk cookies for them and just, you know, enjoy the holiday and food baskets and stuff like that. And so it continued even out here, um, so about 2008, I was coaching um, football and I started a foundation, the Help One Foundation, but I didn't really get into it. All the stuff that I did, I just still did on my own. Sure. I never really looked for help and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but um, just this past year, I re- rebranded it, got, my incorpor- got it incorporated through the state of Arizona, um, had my EIN through the federal government we're still waiting on the processing of our 501c3. Um, but what I do with that is provide scholarships okay. for, for low-income kids to go to, you know, 
camps of their choice. Yeah. Football camp, music camp, church camps, um, computer camps. Yeah. Computer camps um, at ASU for high school kids, it's like $1,000 for a week. Wow. Yeah, gymnastics. Um, one little girl who I'm trying to get funded, her gymnastics cost is $4,000 for the year. Wow. There's a $1,600 competition fee, and then it's like $200 a month. Jeez. For, yeah, pretty pricey. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and so it's hard and it's a hard working family and yeah. stuff like that. And I know they need help. So do stuff like that. Yeah. And then I also do a backpack drive where I do backpacks with supplies for the kids. I just recently started that last year. It was my first year doing that. Okay. And I still do the, the Christmas party for the kids. Wow. Yeah. I was on yeah. your website. It looks, it looks like there's a lot of stuff on there. I saw a lot of ways to donate and a lot of ways to become a volunteer. And it looks, it looks awesome. I mean, that's amazing that you do that. You take your time and you do stuff like that because at the end of the day, I mean, that's all that matters is, is kids become adults and we want to raise them the right way and help them along the way exactly. that we can. Right. And, and I told a friend this story, this is a true story. Last night I was coming home and I had to go to the gas station. I went to the gas station and there was a lady on a motorcycle, a crotch rocket, which surprised me and um, pulled in behind me and was sitting there, I got my gas, but then I wanted to go inside and grab a soda. So I go inside, I grab a soda, I come back out, I see her counting change, okay? And I'm just like, she's been sitting there since I've been getting gas, counting change. So I get ready to leave and I'm just like, hmm, I got some change in my car, um, you know, three, four bucks worth of change. I'm like, I'm gonna give it to her. And I was getting, well, I was about to leave and then I said, uh, was going to go back. And then I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm going to go home. I get around the corner and I'm like, no, because what if that was me? Right. Sure. And right. I don't know what the situation is or anything like that. Right. I turned around, I went back and she was putting gas in at the time. And so I went back, still went back and I stopped beside her, let the window down. And I said, Hey, I seen you counting change. I don't know if you need any extra money. But I have some change here, three or four bucks worth of change. And, you know, you can put a gallon, a gallon and a half in to add, she goes, because she says she put 288 in. And I'm just like, I'm like, here, she goes, no, 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 I can't take it. I'm like, just take it. Mm. And she goes, things are so horrible right now, blah, 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 blah. You never know what three, four dollars will do to help someone. Right, for sure. I tell my friends, I got a thousand friends, okay, over a thousand people on my Facebook page. If they all just donated $5, yeah. I would be able to help 20 to 40 kids this summer. Wow. That's, that's it. Crazy. $5. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's hard to get people just to do $5. Sure. You know, look at look at how often we spend money on stuff that we really don't even need. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's true. that's not a necessity. Right. Just more of a want. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Um. Well, Cool. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you. We talked for about 25 minutes, so, um, I might hit you up again. We'll, maybe we'll talk during the season, see, see where you're at and, um, anything else you want to add? Cause I had an, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for taking time out here. I know you got a busy schedule. Um, uh, I know you got a lot going on and this was finally a time that we could link up and, and get everything together. Um, I appreciate it. The Buffalo fanatics appreciate it. Um, with that being said, thank you, Mark, and have a good rest of your day. Okay. All right, thank you too. Thanks, Mark. All right, bye bye. bye.